All right, we're going live to talk about mold toxicity. And Diana is going to be joining me here shortly. Brilliant. There we go. Okay. Wonderful. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. Awesome. Awesome. So I still honestly cannot see your smiling face, but we're just going to go with it because I know that you're there. Okay. I'm here. <laughs> so no worries. It's so funny. Okay. Well, love it. Love it. So awesome. Thanks for hanging out today and talking about mold. So you know, just for everyone who's joining, you know, we both are passionate about reducing toxicity um, with our clients. So, and we both have books on that. Um, so, you know, I know we want to focus on mold today. So, um, you know, basically I could just start, I guess, with a little intro on mold and why we care about mold. Yeah, absolutely. That's <laughs> Great. And then we can kind of talk about like why we're so passionate about this and why it's so important for people to understand more about mold and how it's impacting them. Absolutely. Sounds great. So, you know, in my book, Conquering Mold, which just came out this week, um, we start basically at the beginning, right? Because what is mold? Like mold is basically uh, not only kind of denied by the conventional medical system, it's just ignored. Uh, that it, the fact that it could be affecting us in our indoor environments, you know, environments uh, affecting our health is still underappreciated and just ignored by the conventional medical system. So, you know, we have bacteria, viruses, fungus, which mold is a fungus, and parasites in our microbiomes, and we really kind of neglect both of those last two. So, you know, this is um, something that I have dealt with personally, like. I was affected by mold illness. My family was years ago. Uh, I think it was a long time ago, but it is something that we dealt with. And um, so that was, you know, I was in conventional medicine at that time, but whenever I went through this and, you know, we had to go through all of this workup before we're, we were diagnosed with, you know, mold illness um, and then healing from that, you know, really inspired me to uh, try to work it into my primary care practice. And that just was basically frowned upon, not, you know, actually kind of laughed at, like <laughs> legitimately laughed at by administration. And so I said, well, okay, I'm going to have to go do this on my own. So I um, now do functional health coaching for nationwide uh, a lot of mold detox, lots of gut health issues as well that we talk about. And so, you know, I'm passionate about it, not only because I've been through it myself, but because I know that it's such a common issue and people are dealing with roadblocks in their health that could be prevented if we just have it on the list. You know, straight up, we need to just think about mold like anything else that could cause symptoms, right? So, yeah. 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 Absolutely. I completely agree. And, you know, I, I got interested in mold and started realizing how much it was impacting people's bodies before I had my own mold journey. It was about this time, about a year ago, where we found mold in our home and we were starting to have symptoms. And I recognized right away, I knew what was happening and what it, what it would feel like in my body. Um, and so we were able to address it, but I wouldn't have been able to do that if I didn't have that background knowledge already, because it could have very well been written off as like, oh, just, you know, mom brain or just fatigue or whatever it is. And I think I, we see that so much in clinical practice as well. Um, we specialize in fertility and complex illness. And I think mold is one of the most common things that we see impacting fertility and hormone health. And sometimes it is in your home. Sometimes it's a prior exposure um, that has impacted the body. And it, there's just been some type of straw that's broke the camel's back and it, it really is causing big issues. So I'm glad that more and more people are talking about this because I think it is underappreciated at how common it is and how, how vastly it can impact the body. And it looks different for everybody. True. Yeah. So true. 
true. I think, you know, it's really important. Like we, I know you have a list in your book, which I have right here too. <laughs> your book and my book. Um, and I have a list, you know, in my book and, and on my reel even today, just like you said, it can be any, any body system, but if any body system is out of whack, you know, with, from the gut to the nervous system, it can affect fertility. So, you know, I think it all, you know, it's all related. Um, and so do you, so I guess we could go over kind of the, what we, our initial process with people um, on how to kind of like get started. Like how do people get started action steps to start uh, kind of evaluating like whether they have mold uh, or other toxins affecting them and then getting them out of the body so they can rebalance. Um, so if you want to take first and then I can. Yeah, absolutely. So um, first I think is having some awareness around what it can certainly do in the body. So understanding symptoms can go a really long ways. And I think, you know, similar to what you said, there are long lists of symptoms that can be what mold looks like for you. And it's not going to look the same, even if there is a mold exposure in your home for everybody who lives in that residence, it can look different for every single person. Um, so I think that's really important to have that awareness to do some level of testing. Um, so I personally do mycotoxin testing via urine um, to look for the excretion of mycotoxins. This is not a foolproof way of doing that by any means, but there are also other signs that we typically see on things like blood work or stool testing that can indicate that there might be something going on in addition to looking at symptoms. Um, and then from there, you know, I always, when we, after we do testing, if we think that there is a possibility of mold being in the current environment, I always recommend that clients test. And I, I know you'll agree is that they have to rule that out. There's no way to know if it is not in the current environment or is in the current environment without testing. And I think this is often somewhere where people go wrong. They say, you know, I live in a new home. There's no water damage. Um, there's nothing that we're aware of. There's no weird smell, anything like that. And there can be, there can be things in the home that are harming you even without those things in place. Yeah. Um, and then of course, from there, we're really thinking about, you know, the, my first step is really focusing on drainage pathways and elimination. So for instance, mm -hmm. a lot of people who have mold exposure, current or prior exposure have really bad constipation, yeah. which means that they are then just accumulating and recirculating all of those toxins. We want to focus on the liver and kidneys and making sure that they're functioning appropriately so that we can actually get rid of the things before we start any type of deep detoxification. Yeah. Is there anything else you would add? Yeah. No, I think that that's amazing. And I think, you know, we have like a similar approach because, um, yeah, I'll do a symptom questionnaire with people. And then my top three tests are going to be the urine mycotoxins, uh, which, as you mentioned, and I love that you said that, you know, it's not, you know, a hundred percent what is left in the body because it is, you know, an excretion test. However, it's the best test that we have. So, you know, we're going to go around doing biopsies of people to figure out mycotoxin levels. So we just don't do that. So that, and then, yeah, let's just say gut testing and organic acid tests are also love those uh, for colonization. And then, yeah, protecting the body and opening the detox pathways before hitting it hard with a bunch of like glutathione and binders and stuff like that. So it's super, super important. And protecting the body involves protecting the home and indoor environments as well. Uh, whether it be cars, you know, I've had multiple clients now who've had to get rid of their cars, uh, school, work, anything like that, um, of course, can be an exposure. Or like you said, mold can live in the body from in utero, hello, um, all the way forward can can be there from that prior exposure due to uh, staying in the fat cells so you know I think that's definitely something that's not not really talked about as much either kind of how it can live in your body you know until in many cases until it's actively detoxed out right so Absolutely. And we often think about, you know, something being toxic from our environment, but what happens when our body becomes the toxic environment and we're mm -hmm. poisonous substances that are keeping us sick? Um, you know, and I think that's one of the things that sometimes people are missing when they do mold detoxification is they're missing that huge component of colonization. Mm -hmm. And it just means that they are constantly detoxing and chasing mold where they're missing this very crucial component. Yeah, so tr true. I mean, and I think... Yeah, it has to be done 
in the right way too. I think it's very nuanced because um, mycotoxins aren't alive, right, you guys? You know that? Um, so the detox, it's like two arms of the treatment or the, the protocol, whatever you want to call it, right? So it's like the antifungals don't do anything for the toxins, but they do do something for the colonization and vice versa. So it's like we have to keep that in mind. And it's like very much, even in mold circles, not it's not put like that hardly ever. So it's like we have to keep that uh, in mind a lot. And of course, other things that can go along with it, right? And I know you talk about this in your book too, and so do I, is that there are a lot of things that can go along with mold, like Lyme disease, like candida, like gut dysbiosis, uh, bacterial imbalances, like parasites, and all of these things, you know, we have to be addressing the mold but also, you know, keep in mind that like, that isn't the only thing either. So, but it does affect all of those. So right. because they all love the toxic environment. So, yep. you know, if you have candida overgrowth, it's like, why is candida feel like it can take root in your body? Like, why is it so welcome there? Yep. Um, and parasites and everything like that. I mean, do you see, you treat a lot of that also, or manage a lot of that with your, um, with yeah. your clients? Absolutely. You know, we see a lot of people in particular who have parasitic overgrowth where they are just getting rid of parasites in the in droves and they just can't seem to get rid of them. And it's like, where is this coming from? Or do I have an exposure that's happening? Anything like that. And we really have to think about toxicity in the body. Why is that happening? Mold is one of the big reasons that we ultimately see that um, be the case because parasites really enjoy toxic terrain. There's been a lot of research that's been done even on things like fish where they're in a polluted environment and the fish will have muscle tissue that is clean and pollutant free, but they have a heavy parasitic load and those parasites are where all of those pollutants are residing. So it's very important that we think about that in the bigger picture, like you said. So even, you know, I see a lot of people who come in and they say, I've been diagnosed with SIBO and I've been chasing SIBO for years and I can't seem to get rid of it. I've done antibiotics, I've done herbs, I've done everything under the sun. Mm -hmm. It's not a bacterial issue. The bacteria are there for a purpose and they're breaking down damaged tissue. But what's damaging the tissue in the first place? And often there's a mold component. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um... I think that's a really important point. There's a question here that I want to address um, dealing with SIRS. So SIRS, um, we often talk about when we're talking about mold because of Shoemaker, who's a pioneer in the field, um, chronic inflammatory response syndrome. So how does my protocol differ from Shoemaker protocol? So briefly, um, and this is covered in my book, Concrete Mold. So, um, and as well, I have some videos on this, but Basically, SIRS is like a very specific diagnostic criteria, right? So you have to have 8 of 13 symptom clusters, positive VCS, some genetic testing, things like that. And so it does, it leaves out a lot of people that are dealing with mold toxicity um, by kind of narrowing it. So it's not all mold related illness is not specifically SIRS diagnosable. Um, but Briefly, you know, the first step of the, of the Shoemaker protocol is removing yourself from the moldy environment, which I totally agree with, and that's on my first step of my protocol. But Shoemaker, uh, I mean, I know he's changing a little bit of his order around now with, with actinobacteria and stuff like that, becoming more of a focus, but doesn't deal as much with um, colonization of mold. And also, you know, I've just found the order that that I do things in is protecting the body first before some of these binders. And I don't use as many prescription binders because I found that I don't need them. It's not that they're like stronger per se, because if you're adding in a bunch of herbal binders, you can really get that strength and that power without using the certain very specific prescription binders and with less side effects. So, and I think addressing dietary, uh, healing first as well as part of the first blanket step of protecting the body is super important and that's not emphasized as much uh, i know they do the low amylose diet but that's only one of a few different diets that you know may help you more specifically than that specific diet so i mean i think it's just there's a few nuances there but uh you know it's testing is a little different but I can interpret Shoemaker labs some of the labs are like blood tests that we can follow to see your inflammation in the body but they're not specific to mold um, usually so right yeah. I totally agree um, I 
I think that there's there's not one right way necessarily to mm. address SIRS or even mold toxicity in the body. Everyone's yeah. going to be different. So I think, you know, a lot of people have obviously had a lot of success with Shoemaker's Protocol yeah. and it works well for some people, but not for everybody. And there has to be this bio-individual approach. So in general, I completely agree with you. I think there has to be a lot of nourishment and support of the body and stabilization prior to bringing in things like binders. And then of course, I, I would agree with you that there's that missing piece of colonization and actually removing that from the body. So, you know, I know what you and I do is slightly different in the way that we address things sometimes. I actually don't use any um, prescription binders. We do all of it mm -hmm. in more of a natural yeah. way. There's no, like, again, there's no right or wrong way. Um, I see people get better with both. It's just what your body can really tolerate and what makes the most sense for you. Yeah, so true. And I think uh, it's it's great to work in like multiple binders. You know, trace min minerals are binders. Probiotics can bind toxins. There's a whole chart. I have a chart in my book and I know there's lots of charts floating around out there. Um, but just of all the binders for toxins, so we can keep it in mind and kind of be adding those in, like, okay, you have your trace mineral drops in the morning, and then you have your charcoal in the empty stomach or your, you know, your combo binder or whatever. And uh, all of these things work together. And like you said, titration, like we have to find the right uh, dose and the right recommendations for each person because everyone's different. How is your gut? How is your nervous system? You know, it's all going to be absorbed differently based on you. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Can we talk about that a little bit? Because I think this is often missed as well. Why is the nervous system so important when we're thinking about both? Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's very, very important. And I can just give a quick example. You know, I had a client this week who was having some plateaus in her improvement. And we had not, you know, she hadn't started the nervous system um, protocol basically done one of those the set programs to do nervous system exercises every day and this month she did and in just you know those few minutes um each day having consistency with that then she got out of fight or flight and is now doing like it's like a switch went off you know if you're if you're in fight or flight then your body can block any intervention you try to do like any supplement, any, you know, food, you can start compounding even more food sensitivities, more food reactions, things like that, because your if your vagus nerve, which runs from the base of the brain all the way down to the gut, uh, is not in the or parasympathetic state, like if it's in the sympathetic or fight or flight or freeze states, then it will not be able to be conducive to healing. Like you're just not in a healing state. And I saw that in my own family too. Like my husband had more symptoms than any of us and he had to do specific, you know, he did DNRS, but there's other programs too. Um, he did that to reset his nervous system because he was having roadblocks in his healing or plateaus, not able to really break through. And, you know, it was, it was important for him to do that. And that really helped him as well. So it's, it's just, it has to be incorporated. It, it's like, there's no option in there. Yes, I totally agree. I think, you know, the brain is ultimately just trying to keep us safe. And when there's mold toxicity and these huge levels of inflammation, it does not feel safe. And so everything that we do, even when we are trying to help ourselves and heal, can feel like an assault on the body and it put makes us put up our walls. So I completely agree. I see huge impacts of the nervous system and really addressing that, which again is going to look different for everybody. It might be really minor for some people and it might really need a huge commitment for others is going to be crucial for actually being able to move through a protocol and feel good doing it as well. Yeah, absolutely. Like you mentioned, I love the way you put that. It's a trauma to the body, right? Like experiencing mold exposure or even if you have an don't have a known exposure, like having unexplained symptoms or having chronic symptoms or infertility is like a trauma to the nervous system that our bodies can hold on to. So, and really our bodies keep the score. I mean, I think that's the book too. I have that book on. So, uh, you know, shout out for all the books, uh, our books and others. Um, it's, it really does, you know, not only do mold toxins stay in the body, but traumas also stay in the body. And again, underappreciated by regular medical systems. So that's why we do functional. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I love what you said in your 
book that it's not that fertility is not just about hormone health. Um, can you say something on that? Yeah, of course. So I think a lot of times when we're thinking about fertility or the inability to conceive or if somebody's having challenges, the first step is we go see our, our OB, GYN, we go see a fertility clinic and they look specifically at the reproductive system. Yeah. So um, one of the things that I often have conversations with clients when they come in to work with us about is they say, I'd like to test my hormones. It, it looks like something's going wrong with my hormones. Yeah. Well, we, we know that's probably the case because you're unable to get pregnant, but hormones are a byproduct of things that are happening from a deeper perspective. And so we have to look at other systems of the body that might negatively impact fertility, like the gut, thyroid, the liver, nutrient deficiencies, even the mitochondria in each cell individually, but then be thinking about what's actually causing dysfunction in those areas. So from my perspective, hormone and reproductive health is a whole body issue. It's yeah. just the end byproduct of dysfunction happening elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's, and I've seen that a lot too with clients who on the symptom questionnaire, one of my questions is about uh, periods and, you know, they have either, it can go either way, like with mold toxicity, right? You can be, have no period or you could have like really heavy periods because things like xerilinone are uh, one of the mold toxins is um, estrogenic. So can just straight up directly um, disrupt the hormones. So, and other ones indirectly as well. So, you know, with getting to those root causes, then we can see the uh, periods normalize and, you know, fertility restored as a really, really cool, you know, side effect, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, the way that I usually explain it, and I think this is true of just about anything when we think about how we go through our daily lives and the things that don't feel good in our bodies is it's just a symptom of something deeper happening. So yeah. if, you know, abdominal pain, that's just a symptom of something else happening. Or if you have thyroid dysfunction or infertility, those are just byproducts. They're not the root cause. Yeah. And so when we dig deep enough, we can find it. And you know, one of the things that I think you're finding as well is that mold plays a part for a lot of people, more than people might might possibly realize. Yeah, yeah, so true, so true. And I think a lot of people are still reluctant to accept that, I guess, because as you say, it's not something we associate with, oh, this can be in any home. It's not a matter of new or old home. It's not a matter of clean versus dirty. It's not a matter of, you know, any of that. It's just, just very common. And it's just one of those things that we need to take into account. And it's, uh, I think the stigma, you know, we're working to correct that and to um, take that out because it's just kind of, it's, you know, it's really silly, but it's, it's kind of been there for so long. Uh, so, so working to kind of just spread awareness that, uh, that mold can cause these symptoms. And so um, I guess just back to, you know, book stuff briefly. So as far as, um, you know, people who are wondering maybe, you know, what can they find out in our books? Um, so in, in my book, basically, like I said, you go from what is mold, how do you find out if it's affecting you? We talked about some testing. How can mycotoxins affect your body? Um, how can you start with that with the uh, force of protocol that I do, protect the body, open the detox pathways, mobilizing the toxins and binding the toxins? And then kind of the, all of the other stuff that has to be worked in, like your lifestyle, dietary, nervous system, comorbidities, and other things that may be present, and then kind of putting it all together. Um, so what about your book? Kind of what is, what can people uh, learn from it? Yeah, absolutely. So we talk about all toxicity to include mold and mycotoxins, but we also talk about heavy metals in the body as well as industrial chemicals and radioactive substances. Mm -hmm. So thinking about things like pesticides, but also things like uranium and radium. And then we talk about the ways that that impacts the key systems in the body that can impact fertility. So while the book is about fertility, we're not talking about hormones. We're really talking about those systems, what dysfunction can look like, how to repair those, and then really digging back into that root cause of how you can actually make changes in your day-to-day -day life to reduce toxicity in your environment. Awesome. Awesome. I love that. So, um, and then do you also do virtual? Like I see clients video visits nationwide. I don't know. Do you guys do virtual or what? Yep, we are fully virtual. So I'm, I'm in Colorado, but my whole team is spread out all over the U S mm -hmm. coast to coast. So we're fully virtual as well. Nice. Yeah. 
I'm in, in Virginia, but uh, but love that uh, you know we can use technology to and and the test and the fact that the testing can be done at home is great too. Yep, absolutely. Um, so all of that can be done at home. Awesome, awesome. So anything else you wanted to go over today? Um um, tell me about why you wrote your book. What made you want to do this? I know it's such a large undertaking and it, yeah, like, you know, child. I know it is a, a labor of love. So tell me more about like, why did you want to do this? Why did you feel like there was a gap? Oh, oh there, I feel like there's a huge gap because, uh, just from being on the conventional medicine side and then coming over to the functional medicine side, I think that, you know, I am in sort of a unique position to try to bridge that gap and reach like, okay, I have been there. I am, I kind of come from a place of the MD training where it's like, okay, I'm putting this so that, you know, yes, you know, I can show this to my old colleagues in the, in the conventional med system, but also, you know, bring in the functional med aspect. But basically the two main actual missions of the book are to reach everyone with unexplained medical symptoms because there are so many people with unexplained medical system, symptoms, you know, being gaslit and everything else by the medical system. And then also to put mold on the list that every doctor has with a differential diagnosis, because it's just not there. Absolutely. That's never on my list. It was not taught to me. It's like, oh, maybe if somebody comes in with allergies, like they could be allergic to mold. It's like, yeah, but that's only very one very small piece of the puzzle with mold. So it's just not, it's not on the list, right? So that's really all we just need to start with is putting it, put it on the list, right? It's very simple, but also not easy. So, um, so that's, you know, we're trying to um, spread the word in as comprehensive of a manner as we could uh, with this book on mold and um, getting it out. You know, we're going to get it into bookstores. We're going to get it onto more and more different sites and ways to, to reach people. And um, yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Congratulations. Where can people buy your book? So right now it's on Amazon and we will be updating everyone in, you know, in the stories and everything else whenever it is elsewhere as well. How about you? Awesome. Mine is on Amazon as well. We are available in bookstores now if you are local and you want yeah. to pick it up, but it's on Amazon for in the Kindle and soft cover editions. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Well, Deja, this is amazing. It's great to connect with you and we'll have to do it again soon. Yeah, absolutely. We definitely will. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.